Good morning. Today, I'm going to start with you a special journey about the update of renal transplantation. And uh, I reviewed more than 300 articles that I'm going to present within the following five lectures. I'll start with the first presentation, and this presentation, Introduction and Transplant Outcome, followed by the update of, renal tra of transplant immunology, immune suppression, transplant nephropathology, and I'll end with the complications of renal transplantation. Let us start the, the, this journey with the first presentation, which is the introduction and transplant outcome. I'll start with small introduction, followed by the data from registry, the outcome of recipient and live kidney donor, the radiology perspectives, and I'll end with closing remark. So to start with, the on December 1954, Murray performed the world's first successful renal transplantation. And I had, I have a great honor to have this photo with him in 2009, and he left our world in 2012. A very important point in the field of transplantation is the ethics and the regulations that governs, the, govern the issue of renal transplantation from the recipient's perspective, donor perspectives, and community aspects. So uh, if we think of, and I, uh, here I'm going to just present the title of two articles. This is the first one, quite revolution in organ transplant ethics. Why? Because there is revolution in the field of transplantation. Traditionally, transplantation have, uh, uh, transplants have involved solid organs such as the kidney, heart, and liver, which are transplanted to prevent recipients from dying. Now transplants are being, are being done to f for of the face, hand, uterus, penis, and larynx that aim at improving recipients' quality of life. And this shift needs a lot of revolution in ethics for, from the doctor side, patient side, the regulators, and the public to rethink of the risk and benefit ratio represented by the change in the issue of transplantation from saving life to offering a better quality of life. A second point just to, I want to highlight is the kidney paired exchange between two donors, between the chain of donors or, or even global. The aim is to overcome poverty barrier in developing countries or the energetical barrier in developed countries. And the kidney paired donation could be a partial solution if implemented effectively in developing countries with far fewer logistical and regulatory issues compared to global kidney exchange. And these uh, issues of organizations work to standardize uh, the regulations to prevent exploitation of poor persons in developing countries. A lot of ethics in many aspects of transplantation, but I stop in here, just this is a sample of ethics. The second question, why we need renal transplantation? Because we have dialysis that can sustain patient's life. If you look here, there is a significant survival advantage of transplantation. Yes, there is an important superiority in quality of life, but here, as you see, this is the survival of patients on transplantation and this on dialysis. Uh, quite different here is present in the survival. This is a five-year survival according to the patient age in compared to the general population here. Yes, uh, there is lower survival for real placement therapy in comparison to the general population. But if you compare transplantation versus dialysis, you can find there is a superior adv advantage of survival for transplant patient in comparison to dialysis patients all through the different ages. This is the, uh, the, the story of success. This is one of the longest survival uh, recipients. I know uh, that there are at least six kidney transplants, transplant recipients who achieved more than 50 year graft survival. Edith had 55 year graft survival. The world's long surviving transplant recipient that was published by Joseph Murray in 2011. And this uh, renal transplant recipients reflected the, the story of success. Why? Because 
the uh, Edith answered a very nice question. Could a transplant sustain the stress of pregnancy? This question was answered in 1958, when Edith gave birth to a son, and two years later to a daughter with no complication. Wanda, who was the identical twin sister, the donor, has had four healthy babies. Edith leaves her son, daughter, four grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. Wanda has four sons, 12 grandchildren and a seventh great-grandchild. Both Edith and Wanda families have remained a part of the extended Murray family with frequent visit together. Here, the, uh, there is a difference between the, this couple and the transplant recipient that we had because this uh, recipient received no immune suppression because the, the uh, donor was the ident sister, the identical twin sister. So here, the issue of pregnancy in single kidney was uh, addressed. The story of uh, living longer after kidney transplantation, this, uh, this another report from the division uh, of the, this division of transplantation in Minnesota. Here, this is the two recipients who had immune suppressive drugs. This is in comparison to the previous one. Here, both of them received the immune suppressive drugs. And the, uh, the first one, the graft survived for 50 years until the patient resumed dialysis again. And the second one had a good graft function at the last follow-up after more than 50 years of transplantation. And this table summarizes the medical problems for both recipients. Here, on the, the first one, at uh, the age uh, 11 years post-transplantation, the patient had fracture and then peptic ulcer uh, 27 years after transplantation, 32 years uh, after transplantation, the first of four skin cancer, and then type 2 diabetes later, hyperlipidemia and hypertension, atrial fibrillation, 50 years post-transplantation. The second recipient, after seven years of transplantation, he had graft, uh, gastro surgery reflux, uh, cervical dysplasia, uh, then first of three skin cancer, attached retina, cataract, osteopenia, hyperlipidemia, myocardial infarction, hypertension, arrhythmias, requiring ablation, and uh, macular degeneration, uh, 50 years of post-transplantation at the age of 79. So this, uh, these two uh, cases and the previous one reflected the success of transplantation. So renal transplantation can save life, prolong life, and give a, a better quality of life. Let us go to the uh, registry. Um, here, even in, um, at uh, the Urology and Infrastructure Center in Mansoura, uh, uh, we are, uh, uh, I have a great honor to work under the supervision of uh, Professor Mohammed Onim, uh, who is the founder of renal transplantation in Egypt and in the Middle East. And uh, currently, we uh, have uh, more than uh, 2,845 cases, 2,846 cases by this uh, July 1st. And this is my honor to have the photo with Professor Ghanim. Uh, and we have our, our registry. Uh, so at any certain, at any moment, you can click on the computer to know the patient survival, direct survival, a lot of complications, and the old immune suppression and the tissue typing. So this is a great, uh, advantage of the real transplantation uh, at Mansoura Urology and Infra Center. Regarding the scientific registry of transplant recipients that was um, that was published within the American Journal of Transplantation in January this year, you can find a lot of data about the number of total kidney transplants from living and from from living and from cadaveric transplantation by years. You can find here the, the number of transplant, and here you can find there is uh, some uh, increasing growing of the cadaveric, and there is a slight decline of live donor kidney transplantation. And this is the graft failure uh, at uh, six months, one year, three years, five years, and ten years. You can find here there is improvement 
of graph survival by decline the graph failure by uh, years and this is the death sense of the graft failure among adult uh, living donor kidney transplant recipients six months one year three years five year and ten years so you can find here the uh, there is improvement of survival and decline of the uh, failure by the years and this is death with function graft so you can look at the the data even the donor nephrectomy, either open nephrectomy, laparoscopic, you can uh, look at the different data and you can review the this issue of American Journal of Transplantation to know a lot about the data registry of renal transplantation. Let us go to the sector of transplantation outcome. And I'm going to discuss some factors, interesting factors that uh, were published uh, within the uh, this new data. Here, I'm going to address the issue of age, age-dependent risk of graft failure in young kidney transplant recipient. This is from French kidney transplant database, including uh, approximate 60,000 patients. The data of all first kidney transplantation performed before 30, 30 years of age between 1993 and uh, 2012 were extracted from the French kidney transplant database, a total of 5,983 renal transplant recipients were included. The risk of graft failure was found to increase around the age of 13 years until the age of 21 years and decrease thereafter. If we look here to this uh, figure, you can find the evolution here. This is the, the hazards, evolution of overall estimated hazards of graft failure according to the current age of kidney transplant recipients adjusted for both age at transplantation and time since transplantation. There are, there may be different reasons that explain the increased graft failure during adolescence period. Here, this is the jump, and this is the peak of graft failure within the adolescent period. The question why? Why in this adolescent there is increasing graft failure. This may be because of non-adherence. And non-adherence may be related to the neurocognitive maturity that the adolescent and the early adulthood uh, recipients want to represent their specific identity and to develop destiny to identity from their parents and tries to get rid of their authority. And the second potential cause of increased risk of graft failure during adolescence uh, and emerging adulthood may be related to the fact that this age corresponds to the transition period from pediatric nephrology units to adult transplant units. So we need comprehensive look at non-adherence by educating patients and their families about the issue of drug adherence because this is a very crucial and the second point is the comprehensive look at the transition from the pediatric to adulthood let us to review important data about the the outcome estimated adjust hazard of graft failure among young kidney transplant recipients here if you look at the age of 13 to 23 versus less than 13 or about 23 here you can find the adjusted hazard risk is 1.85 for this age, for 13 to 23, and uh, in comparison to the young age and to the older age, it is 1.25. So this means that this age is risky, and we should look carefully for the non-adherence and transition. And this is the for you can here look at the different variables and the adjusted hazard risk for the uh, here you can find survival advantage of living kidney donors in comparison to the cadaveric donor because the hazard risk of graft failure increased here from 1 to 1.76 and you can uh, fix this table and look at the different variables i'm not going to uh, address anymore so age is important and adolescent age is very crucial to be uh, thought regarding sex uh, here this study included uh, 159,000 patients cadaveric transplantation 
in the scientific registry of transplant recipient database who received the first disease kidney transplant between 1995 and 2013. And it is very interesting to look at the results here. This is the code of female recipients. So this is a female recipient. And this is the closed circle of the male recipients. Here, if you look at the recipient age here, less than 25 year old, you can find here the uh, uh, graft failure is higher in female recipient. So because of this censored graft failure rates, so the graft failure here occurs uh, more common in women in renal transplant female when they had male donor. And this is on the in the age below 25 years. And even if the donor is female, women had also higher graft failure in comparison to men until the age of 45 years when the uh, the graft failure is reduced so it this data may reflect the issue of sex hormone or hy effect because the uh, female recipient may have antibodies against uh, y uh, engine uh, of the uh, of the uh, male donor so this is a lot of complexity here uh, cannot we cannot explain all the difference based on the uh, the sex hormones that may affect the immunity but we put all these data together in our mind for evaluation for expecting the risk for the graft survival and addressing the how to handle immune suppressive, suppressive medication in a fantastic way in this uh, gender a very interesting point which is outcome calculator although uh, for my perspectives i cannot judge the transplant out outcome based ex exclusively on the outcome calculator but it is a very nice added tools to the transplant just to, to give arbitrary data for the recipient and for the donor about the success of transplantation because this calculator in, uh, was extrapolated from 232,000 recipients kidney uh, transplantation of kidney transplantation uses scientific registry of transplant recipient data and by analysis more than 232,000 recipients of kidney alone transplants uh, that were carried out between 1998 and 2012 this calculator provides useful information to donor and candidates and physician of estimated outcome and potentially in allowing candidates to choose among several living donors it may also help inform candidates with compatible donors on the advis advisability of joining a kidney bird donation. Again and again, it is a very nice tool, but shouldn't be taken alone in consideration. And here you can find a lot of data in the calculator. If you have a living unrelated, the living related and donor and according to donor obese, recipient to obese, and what are the five year and 10 years, so you can you can know the uh, impact of this issue. Let us go to the very interesting point. This, this example illustrates the use of this calculator uh, to select the best donor for the recipient. If you have this uh, uh, kidney graft failure estimate for 50 year old man with three potential donors. So the recipient is 50 year old man. And these are the available three donors. This is the donor one, donor two and donor three sister unrelated unrelated and this is the data of the first donor 55 year female uh, sex uh, not obese uh, uh, donor recipient to a ratio 0.7 the tissue typing is like this 3 HLA mismatch and on the R mismatch and here the second one and this is the data of third one if I fix the data on this issue who will be the best donor that we expect the uh, better uh, graft survival for the patient if we proceed for uh, transplantation. It's clearly the second one because according to the calculator, here estimated graft failure at five years here is 
here 16 and here 13.6 and the 10 years here 30 39 36 so again if we want to select the best for the, the recipient we will select as a second donor so on this is one of the advantage of this calculator uh, regarding our data, this uh, our report was published. In, the last report was published in 2013 by the great professor Onim, and the overall graph survival was 86.7% uh, and 65.5% at five and ten years, respectively. The projected half-life of four organs uh, for grafts was 17.5 years, and for patient 22 years. Five factors had an independent negative impact on graft survival, donor's age, the genetic concentration, type of immune suppressive medications, uh, number of acute rejection episodes, and total steroid used during the first three years, three, first three months after transplantation. So this is the, our data from Urology and Nephrology Center. And by the way, we had uh, the uh, survive, the longest surviving recipients now we had a uh, surviving 35 years 35 years were doing well was uh, was good graph function let us go to the live kidney donor is there any problem for live kidney donor one of the important points to be considered is the issue of hyperfiltration because when we take a kidney and leave a kidney there is physiological hyperfiltration after living kidney donation, physiological hyperfiltration occurs in which kidney uh, uses its re re reserve capacity. This process can cause graft uh, GFR increase for up to five years after donation. We should put this issue in our mind. And I, I suggest to look at the hyperfiltration variable because if this donor develops a diabetic nephropathy, what's your expectation? Diabetic nephropathy will be faster in the donor because there is the issue of hyperfiltration is preceding. If a donor develops a diabetic nephropathy, GFR also occurs early in the disease uh, through, through a different mechanism. Finally, over the past decades, the mean body mass index of the kidney donor population has increased. So, and the obesity, obesity associated hyperfiltration is strongly associated with end stage renal disease risk on the long term. These factors and this cause of hyperfiltration could be put in our mind to know the end stage renal disease risk within the uh, donors. So the hyperfiltration should be put in our mind when we look at the donors. The pattern of end stage kidney disease after kidney donation in the live kidney donors and this is from uh, the big series of 125,000 uh, kidney donor here you can find the pattern of end stage kidney disease for diabetes hypertension and glomerulonephritis here uh, 10 years uh, 10 to 25 years you can find here the uh, difference between diabetes hypertension and glomerulonephritis by the way we should think of the factors that can lead to diabetes after kidney donation the most important risk factors of diabetes after kidney donation are obesity and the smoking so should educate donors to stop to never to um, to smoke and we should educate donor not to gain weight after donations another important point how to quantify the post donation risk of end stage kidney disease because it is very important, crucial. Here, this is the data of 133,000 uh, living kidney donors show the uh, risk factors for end stage kidney disease. You can find uh, the, uh, here the uh, men in comparison to women, black race, uh, age, body mass index is very interesting because we should educate uh, against the body weight gain uh, all these factors are significantly associated with end stage kidney disease occurrence in the, after kidney donation. And uh, this is another calculator for the end stage renal disease risk expectation in live kidney donor. So if you have a donor, male, non-African American, age 25, body mass index 23, uh, and the donor is the first 
degree, biological relative to recipients. Here, this is the expectation per 10,000, 25 per 10,000 after 20 years of kidney donation. If we fix all the data like this, but change the body mass index to, to 34 instead of the uh, 23, what happens here? And instead of having the risk of 25 per 10,000, here the risk increased to 70 per 10,000. And this is the live kidney donor risk for diabetes, as I mentioned, the body mass index and the smoking should be put in our mind to avoid uh, weight gain and never to smoke. But we should put in our mind that the, there is uh, a problem in any calculator, uh, so we should know the limitations of calculators and uh, we shouldn't take it a, a, a single uh, look at the calculator because this is a very nice study, although included a uh, fewer number of donors and non-donors to end stage renal disease risk calculators were recently developed by Grams and Abraham, Abraham to calculate end stage renal disease risk before donation among live kidney donors. However, those calculators have never been studied among the potential donors for whom donation was refused due to medical contraindication and compared to a group of donor, then the, uh, if you look, compared the 15 years and the lifetime in decision and disease of donor and non-donors due to medical costs as estimated by those two calculators, in decision and risk calculator could be complementary to standard, standard screening strategy, but cannot be used alone to accept or decline donation because here, you can find a significant difference here between donors, 0.1, uh, here non-donor 0.25, uh, statistical significant, uh, 15 years, but a lifetime, the risk is approximately the same, and there is uh, insignificant risk based on the first calculator and the same within the second calculator. Let us go to the radiology because uh, this is a very expanding field in the in the issue of uh, uh, transplantation. Why we think of radiology, laboratory, anything, because it is non-invasive. So because as all of us know, diagnosis rejection depends upon needle biopsy. However, most imaging techniques like contrast enhanced ultrasound and magnetic resonance exploit the fact that blood flow is significantly lower in case of acute rejection induced inflammation. In addition, acute rejection associated recruitment of activated leukocytes may be detectable by uh, fluorodeoxyglucose PET scan. And none of these approaches has been adopted yet in the clinical follow-up of kidney transplant recipients, but standardization of procedures may help uh, assess reproducibility and compare diagnostic yields in large prospective multicenter clients. So, yes, it is fantastic to look at the graft by non invasive way, but we still we need an evidence for the reproducibility. The issue of three-dimensional ultrasound, this is a very nice uh, issue, and the aim is, does 3D ultrasound uh, replace the issue of uh, MRI or CT? Uh, if we look here at the the data, if you compare this uh, this uh, figure by the three-dimensional ultrasound, you can find here three-dimensional ultrasound gave more delineation and illustration of the anastomosis as shown in this drawing. And this is a separate arteries, here the separate arteries. So three-dimensional ultrasound gave a better resolution. And here, this is double artery with the stenosis in this segment. So uh, here, another stenosis. So it seems that ultrasound, by the use of three-dimensional technique, is a advantage. So the addition of 3D ultrasound to duplex 2D ultrasound evaluation of renal transplants enabled the more precise and thorough delineation of the arterial anastomosis than did two-dimensional ultrasound alone. Multiple features, including surface rendered multiplanar reformatting with a color doubler, 
The authors believe that 3D ultrasound should be added to the routine examination of renal transplant because it has the capability to add important information to a 2D sonographic examination that may obviate the need for confirmatory testing by MRA, CT, or CTA. They suggested additional larger studies uh, to be obtained to confirm this data. Another important point is the MRI uh, innovations. With the introduction of new functional MRI techniques, administration of exogenous gadolinium-based contrast agents has often become unnecessary. And true non-invasive assessment of the algorithm function has become possible. If you look here, these are, these are the different techniques that can be done without contrast, without gadolinium. To look at the oxygenation status, blood oxygen level dependent MRI, bold MRI, water diffusion and tubular flow by diffusion weighted imaging, DWI, diffusion tensor imaging, DTI, arterial blood flow by arterial spin labeling, ASL, L scarring by T1 in rotation, rotating frame, T1P, magnetic resonance elastography, MRE, diffusion, uh, weighted imaging, diffusion tensor imaging, inflammation by ultra small supramagnetic particle on, of iron oxide, USBIO, enhanced imaging, uh, vascular activity, hemodynamic response image, imaging, maintenance of corticomedullary uh, sodium gradient by 23 sodium MRI. So, a lot of advantages and technique that can answer the question of uh, the allograft and graft function here you can look at the different thing if you, you want to assess the blood flow the oxygenation gfr uh, fibroblast proliferations macrophage infiltration if an inflammation you can use these different techniques here the uh, glomerular injury you can take this technique capillary refraction this technique so a lot of issues, a lot of questions can be answered by using the innovations in MRI. What this? This is diffusion tensor imaging uh, of the kidney in a healthy volunteer. Diffusion tracks running from the cortex through the medullary pyramids are depicted. The different colors indicate the net direction of diffusion. Fantastic views. Another advantage in the MRI that uh, is shown and uh, by the uh, this technique that uh, so this is intra voxel in coherent motion analysis of renal graft diffusion with clinical and histopathological correlation in pediatric kidney transplant patients this is a preliminary cross section observational study and if you look here at the the uh, purpose of this study was to convert ivim values in pediatric with histopathology and the clinical uh, management uh, uh, change. This study included 15 pediatric renal transplant recipients uh, that uh, who were prospectively scanned on a three Tesla MR scanner with multi uh, DTI. The idea is shown in this figure, as you see here. This is the motion uh, in normal kidney, demonstrating at the microscopic level normal flow of water. Here, the, everything is normal. So, uh, the uh, normal flow of water molecules in the intravascular, interstitial, intracellular spaces uh, in comparison uh, uh, to the second one, the abnormal. Here, the flow is affected. The normal flow of water molecule is affected by process such as cellular necrosis, cellular edema, fibrosis, and the presence of filamentary cells. You can look at the, this is the concept that can be captured by this MRI technique. Another point in radiology, what this? This is CT scan with coronal image showing ectopic kidney. This is the ectopic left pelvic kidney showing the middle polar artery. The question is, can we consider this uh, persons as a potential kidney donor? Here, this was a successful case successful use of ectopic pelvic kidney for live related donation technical aspects and literature review were uh, discussed within this case report yes 
we can use ectopic pelvic kidney for living kidney transplantation, but it needs high demanding surgical procedure and uh, a good uh, well experienced hands to uh, uh, tackle this process. I want to conclude by two important points that we can add uh, the care, we can improve the care by using telemedicine uh, the, uh, here because telemedicine improved non-adherence so it decreased the non-adherence from 56% to 17.4% when the telemedicine telemedically supported care uh, telemedicine was added to the standard care another fantastic issue is 3d bioprint te technology uh, and its application are rapidly developing its ethical implication are multifaceted and complex and deserve a strict debate among the positive aspects we could avoid the moral implication referring to the removal of organ and tissues from a dead donor so just to copy from a person so this is a very interesting data to be put in mind a lot of evolution in science is present i should end here the end of the first presentation about introduction and transplant outcome and i end with william osler's statement he who studies medicine without books sales and uncharted sea but he who studies medicine without patience doesn't doesn't go to see at all at this point i should stop thank you very much for a uh, good listening and i'll be happy to have any question on my email